Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning, everybody. This is Running Around Jerusalem, episode 11. Episode 11, I've got, I, I need my fingers. And today we're outside Jaffa Gate, New Gate's over there, but you already know that because you've been watching us. Michael, today's run is spiritual elevations. What are we gonna see today? Well, we are going from the old city into one of the most storied uh, neighborhoods in all of Jerusalem called Meir Sharim, a bastion of the ultra-Orthodox. We're going to explore this neighborhood that is not often explored yes. and end up at one of the hidden gems here in Jerusalem. One of the neighborhoods nobody knows about even. Exactly, the old Arab neighborhood. Of Lifta. Of Lifta yes. and the spring there. Come run with us, please subscribe to the channel. Come check our Facebook page as well, Running Around Jerusalem on Facebook. Let's go, Michael. So spiritual elevations, you say? You got it. Okay, and I've heard a little birdie tell me that this one is actually gonna be connected to last week's run. We've got a common theme. Yes, and that is we're waiting at traffic lights again. No, right, no, no, we we're fine, we're fine, we're fine. We've got no traffic lights, keep going. Yeah? So we are... Guys, our common theme is not traffic lights, just to make that clear. Yeah, keep going. We have the old city right there. We're leaving the old city walls. And we last, uh, the last episode, we talked a lot about Reuben Rivrin's family yeah. and how his uh, grandfather was instrumental in founding different neighborhoods outside the old city walls. Yeah. Well, we're going to one of those neighborhoods. And Mayor for those who have been watching, Reuben Rivlin is the, the president. The president of Israel, right? Yeah. So, Mea Sharim, which is the neighborhood that we're going to now, was one of the ones that was founded by Rivlin. Yeah. So, it is one of the first neighborhoods outside the old city walls. Uh huh. And so, what kind of neighborhood? is the neighborhood that we're going into. So, this is actually a, an ultra-Orthodox neighborhood. Right. Or if you really want to use the correct term, the Haredi. Haredi literally means those who tremble. Tremble. The we're idea talking is very that, devout Jews. Exactly. Right. All right. The idea of trembling before God. So we're talking about basically very, very devout religious Jews. Is that correct? That is correct. Why tremble? Why is that the phrase to explain what's trembling? one of the highest values you have <laughs> in the uh, Orthodox circle is what's called fear of God, fear of, of right. you know, the Almighty. The Almighty, okay, fine. I got what you're saying. So that's the so idea. So I'm trembling in fear of the Almighty. That's basically where it comes from. Yeah, but it, it's, it actually is even more interesting because where you get this group of this or this sect or movement really is the correct word yeah. of Jews. Well, really, it comes out of the same place that uh, uh, you get all the other movements of, of Judaism, like Reform and Conservative and Modern Orthodox. And that is, it comes out of the Enlightenment back in the mid 18, <coughs> mid 1700s. I see. So this is a direct response to? It's a, one of the responses to the Enlightenment. We'll talk about how that is in a little bit. But as we're about to get towards the neighborhood, yeah. I also want to give you an idea, a window into this community and what we're going to see along the way. We're not going to peek in people's windows though, right? I think I'd appreciate that. It's a response to enlightenment. So are we saying there's kind of fundamentals that this community stands on? Yes. Okay. And, and there's no better way to describe it than this very famous uh, uh, verse in the Jewish texts. Right. That says that the world stands on three things. Three things. I think I know this one. Torah, yeah. Avodah, which really in our sense means prayer. Yeah. And Gemilut Chasadim, which are acts of loving kindness. Acts of loving kindness. Okay, so Torah, which is study of the text. Yes. Uh, prayer <coughs> and acts of kindness. Exactly. Definitely edit this out. But you remember we talked about the smells of the various places? The smell is unbelievable. Uh, 
okay, so how do these three fundamentals come to represent themselves in the kind of the community that we've just well, sort of entered into? Well, here's a great example into? right here, okay? Am I right? Yeah, it says, dot Aaron. Okay? Right, what's, the, what's is, that? It's an enormous yeshiva. So yeshiva is a... Yeshiva is a house of learning, okay? So, Torah study. Torah study. Right, okay? okay. And it's where boys go in order to study. It's like this school. Right, my next for, question, men and women alike, what we say? Well, these are just for men. Just for men. We are actually gonna see uh, schools that are dedicated just to girls as well, but the boys and the girls are all gonna study separately. They're not gonna be at the same place. Right. So if we talk about the fundamentals of the more Haredi community, so men, Torah study, prayer, women, establishing family, taking care of home? Uh, yes. However, there was informal education of the women a long time ago, but now you actually have formal education as well, which was started relatively early. You're talking about 150 years ago, uh -huh. almost. Today, in Israel, you have more people studying in yeshivot, okay, in these houses of Torah study, than probably any other time in the history of the world. Right. Which is really quite astounding if you go back to 1948. Right. Because this whole world that we see around us which we really can see around us at the moment. It really is like a 360 experience. Obliterated in Europe in the Holocaust. Right. And in 1948, when the state of Israel was established, you had 400 people only who were studying in yeshiva. And in fact, the leaders of the Haredi community approached Prime Minister Ben-Guri and said, look, let's make a deal. Jesus. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make a deal. This place is insane. <laughs> yeah, go on. I'm staying uh, on the sidewalk. Yeah. Please exempt our yeshiva students from serving in the army. From serving in the army. Right. And Begorian looks around and says, okay, 400 yeshiva students? Sure, we can do that. Right. Now, there's something that we have to understand here fundamentally about why would they want to be exempt from this. Number one, they felt that Torah study is one of the foundations of the world. So right. just as defending people physically is important, so is maintaining the spiritual connection and the spiritual defense. Right. And that is just as, if not more important to the welfare of the Jewish people. Now right. you think about that, four from 400 yeshiva students, today we're talking about tens of thousands. Okay, the largest yeshiva you have here is one called the Mir Yeshiva, which is over 5,000 people who are studying there. Amazing. So Michael, after we've spoken about the fundamentals of the community and how it kind of goes through itself, let's talk about like a second what we can see around us. Because obviously this looks very different from what we've run through. Yeah, before. first of all, look at these placards we have on the left. Okay. Yeah. All, right. all black and white. All black and white. Um, look, some of it is notices of uh, people who passed away. Okay. Right. Uh, but you also have this is how news is disseminated. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's kind of like it's very old school in that it's way. It's like town crier almost. Just yeah. In so, so why aren't they? Uh, why aren't they open up their like <laughs> smartphones and getting the news that way? Don't do those. They don't do that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> because the community very much their response to the enlightenment was that hey, the enlightenment is you have these two trains on a collision course between modernity and the traditional Judaism, they cannot coexist. So we are going to basically isolate ourselves off from modern society. Yes. Okay, for the sake of preserving Judaism. Now it doesn't mean they don't use cell phones. It doesn't mean, you know, there are cars around here. Okay? Sure. They don't reject it. They, it's the communications, the access to the outside world and their values yeah. that they try to insulate themselves against. Look, this is why you get the dress that looks like they're out of the mid 1800s. Exactly well, right, yeah. Because they're like, okay, we're gonna freeze everything, including our dress, because that's gonna be more modest. And if you look at the stores, yeah. you look at like the shoes and things that are sold. Judaica, okay. suits, Judaica. ties, like it's a very, specific kind of shopping yeah this but area. good luck finding shoes in one of these stores that aren't black exactly it's, it's, <laughs> it's like very within very very strict guidelines 
it doesn't really go left or right. But at the same time, by the way, people who want to buy Judaica, this is where they come to when you come and visit. For sure. Okay. For sure. Also, you get some really cheap appliances and stuff around here too. We spoke about the third fundamental, which was acts of kindness. How does that kind of personify itself inside the community? So it's interesting because when you think about the reputation that the Haredi community has, the reputation, by the way, statistics back this up, there's one of the poorest communities in Israel. In Israel, All okay. Right. Partially because a huge segment of the men are not working. They don't go to work. They're going to yeshiva. Yeah. And Fundamental they have number one. huge number, huge families. Yeah, so average uh, in Israel is three and a bit. Average Haredi community comes closer to seven. Yes. So big difference. Yes. Yeah. But one of the fascinating things is that in the Haredi community, you have one of the highest instances of charity that's given. Yeah. And one of the ways this happens is something called a gamach. Okay. Which is really the acronym for Gemil Hasadim, Acts of Loving Kindness. If you need medicine, there's a gamach for medicine that you go and there are people with extra excess medicine. You need one for... Wedding dresses. Wedding dresses, uh, school supplies, anything, you name it, there's a gamach for it. I'll that's give you an example. It, it. Anyone watch the Israeli TV show Stiesel? There's a episode in the first season where the, the main character opens up a gamach for heaters. So he's got these space heaters and all these people keep starting uh, yes, right. knocking on his house to get these heaters. Right. Gamach for everything. Let's, we got we to look at this building here. Okay. This has got a great story. Hidden gem, hidden gem. Michael's hidden gems. Just take a water breather for a second here. So what what is this building? It's definitely not Haredi, or I think even Jewish by looking at it. What, what is this place? How amazing would it have been to be like a brick in this wall over the centuries? Right. Because this building and this complex really, it's all around us. Okay, right. except for the brand new buildings. Yeah. Okay, was established at the same time they're starting to build outside <laughs> of the old city walls. Okay, in like 1860, it was an orphanage. It's called the Schneller compound. Again, we German? have with the Germans, Germans, just like we saw at the Hansen house, yeah, yeah, okay? Germans again. Who are building up parts of Jerusalem. But how do you remember it? So this was an army base. When I joined the army, this whole place was an army hospital base. Hundreds of soldiers on a Sunday would arrive in here to get their buses to all over the place. Mine was down south usually. What's it used as today? I don't know. It's a base Yaakov school. Right. Okay, which is like the preeminent Haredi girls school. So you go from an orphanage, Christian orphanage. Christian orphanage, to German orphanage. Yeah. An Israeli army base yeah. to a Haredi girls school. Yeah, a rock like, in the, throughout uh, the centuries. Stone in the wall would have been great. So you mentioned there the Bet Yaakov or House of Jacob in strict translation school system. So what, what's that? It's actually a fascinating story. We started by a woman named uh, Sarah Schneer uh -huh. uh, who lived in Poland in the early 1900s and realized that, hey, you know what? Girls are not getting formal education. Although I will tell you that in Poland at this time, most of the Jewish women were literate because there was an informal education. I but see. she says, let's formalize this. And she gets the blessings of the different rabbis all around and starts this whole girls school movement. Right. It is huge, huge today. And Enormous, international. Yeah. Every place where you see a Jewish community in the world, you're gonna see a Bet Yaakov school. As we take this corner, I'm gonna see very, very new buildings. Down at the bottom of the hill, quite old school Jerusalem, a bit grotty, a bit on the poor side. Here, brand spanking, a massive new complex. Nice. 
place to play for the kids in the middle. I can see a kindergarten over there. I can see another Betty Arkhoff school over here. Right. Which is amazing because this defies the, uh, the stereotype. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The stereotype of the Haredi community. Okay. Like when we think about the Haredi community, what we think about is down at the bottom. Yes. Here, we're still in that community, but it's completely changed. Yes. So what's what's going on here? Look, there's a lot of money in there as well. You have people who have been successful business people. Right. <laughs> and they're pumping money here and people want to live here. I see. Yeah, so it's quite a big um, Anglo, American, UK, whatever, um, influence coming into these communities that are buying up apartments for the younger generation so they can carry on sitting and learning in the Ascend Yeshiva. And hence, new money's coming in. And so this whole area is kind of changing its feel entirely. And by the way, where are we headed right now? We're headed, Where to are we one, headed on? we're headed to one of the most magnificent, magnificent synagogues. Magnificent. Magnif ah, the magnificent. <laughs> yes. Magnificent synagogue that you will see in Israel and perhaps in the world. Uh, and it is the synagogue of the Hasidic Court of Bells. So, wait, wait. Let's slow down with your concepts a minute. The Hasidic sect of bells. So, question one that I have. What's a Hasidic? Or okay. Hasid or... What's the singular? So under the umbrella, under the umbrella of ultra-Orthodox or Haredim. Uh -huh, so I've got okay. my umbrella. Yeah. Right. You have one movement, which is called Hasidim. Okay. And Hasidim uh, came about in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And what happens is that the Jewish community of Eastern Europe is a time when Torah study, one of our pillars, one okay, of our three pillars yeah. essentially has been limited to people who have the means in order to pay for it. Right. And you have a huge destructions that have befallen the, the rest, most of the Jewish community. Right. Most of them are in poverty. And you get this movement that says, no, everyone can serve God. And let's find some joy in this. Let's have singing. Let's have dancing. Let's have spirit. Let's infuse this prayer with something that's going to make you want to jump up and dance like one of these like, gospel choirs. Type right, thing. Okay. 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 Um, and Excellent and this is the Hasidic movement. And they make, they also want to make Torah study more accessible. And any, every little farmer, every little like peddler, right. whatever you could devote to Torah, if it's 30 minutes, an hour a day, is it that way? That's good. And that's going to help give you the connection. And this is where this whole Hasidic movement comes from. The other defining characteristic of the Hasidic movement uh -huh. is that it's all based around this spiritual uh, guy who is their Rebbe. And he's not just there to teach Torah, he's there to give you advice. He's there to help you know, give you support. Uh, and every little town and shtetl in Eastern Europe is going to have a Rebbe. Right. And you're going to have a sect or a court of Hasidim Built around, around the every single one. So Bells right. is from Bells. Which Lubavitch was a town. Lubavitch is from Lubavitch, okay? Yeah, so these, these places are were towns. towns. They're all towns. In Eastern Europe. And this right. synagogue that we see right here really is gonna represent how amazing the Jewish community in Poland was before the Holocaust. Look at this amazing building. I okay, mean, this is it's a enormous. <laughs> it is, but this is an exact replica and copy of the Bell's synagogue that was in Poland. It's firstly just the size of the place. So this is fundamentally a place of prayer. Yes. Right. But you also have you also have learning that's going on here as well. Right. Now I actually had the pleasure of spending a Shabbat here once. It's an unbelievable experience. You go into the synagogue. Yeah. And you have to imagine. It's hard to imagine this today because we're in the midst of this pandemic and you can't really have big gatherings. Yeah. But when I was in this synagogue, you're talking about packed shoulder to shoulder, no room to do anything. In this building? In this how building. How many people is that? On a Friday night, thousands. Oh my goodness. Thousands, okay? So how loud the prayers? Like it's, it's, <laughs> it's like a cacophony of everything. And what's really amazing because of that is that there are certain types and times in the service when the, sur the, the prayer leader needs to get everyone's attention. Right. So what has happened, they, on the, the stage in the middle, which is yeah. called a bima, yeah. they have this big pillow and the guy has a paddle. And every time he wants to 
get the attention, he goes whack, whack. Just because there's whack. so many people. Yeah, and so they hear the pat, the paddle on the pillow. And they know there's supposed to respond. And there's silence. That's incredible. And he says what he needs to say. Everyone responds, and then just go back to this like enormous den of everything. It's an amazing, amazing experience. Unbelievable. Okay, so after you had your amazing experience of prayer at this beautiful and outstanding prayer house of bells, what, what, how did the story kind of continue? <laughs> so what happens on a Shabbat, okay, on a, right. the Sabbath day, is that then you go back and have a festive meal. So I went back to a random family's house. They invited me in. That lives in the area. Okay, that lives in the area. Right. And we had this amazing, wonderful, uh, like five course meal. Right, okay. And, and this is important because you know, the whole concept of Shabbat hospitality is huge in this community. Now, I had this arranged beforehand because of the yesh my yeshiva I was studying it in, and we took a trip here. But I could go here. Turn up. Turn up. Yeah, you'll get invited. <laughs> and you will get so many different invites. And I did that many times throughout my time here in Be'er Sharim. Yeah. And you'd end up in some of the most amazing houses. My time in Bells, one of the interesting things is, we go back to this family's house, yeah, and there's a little bit of a language issue oh, because okay. they didn't speak Hebrew. They did not speak Hebrew. They didn't speak English. So we had a whole discussion in one of our runs about how Hebrew became such yes. a fundamental language of Israel, but they did not speak Hebrew. Or English. Or English. So you know what they spoke? I'm going to assume Yiddish. Yiddish. Yiddish was the the language in Eastern Europe of the Jews. Right, it's okay. kind of a mishmash of Hebrew and terms and German terms. It's Hebrew plus German plus whatever the vernacular is. Yeah, and a bit of Polish jumped in there for good measure. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, but this is in the Haredi community is one of the places that it's actually really preserved. Right. Because other than that, no one really speaks it anymore. So there was lots of sign language at that Friday night dinner going, mmm, <laughs> yummy, like what? <laughs> Something like that. There's a lot of singing. Right. Okay, we still knew the songs. Uh, but I'll tell you, I've had similar experiences also in random places in the Maya Shireem. I once went to this amazing shul called the Pence Carleen Shul. And what's amazing about that I'd be place. There. I know that is. Yeah. Sure. And what's unique about it is that they scream everything. That's right, yeah. Okay, so you go Especially to the, the prayers. Kids. Yeah. It's absolutely thunderous. The entire prayer is screaming. Yeah, it's very loud. But it's so powerful. Yeah. And I went there once and I got picked up by some random family in this little hole in the wall in the middle of Maya Shireem. And it turns out the, the guy was a 12th generation Yerushalmi. 12th generation? So I asked him, is that why your Yerushalmi kugel tastes so good? And he said, actually, my wife's from Poland. <laughs> <laughs> so there's like a number of points to pick up there. So as we spoke about holy migrations, Israelis are new. Like I'm obviously, I moved here. My kids are first generation. You know, my wife was born here, but her parents were not, and so on and so on and so forth. So, to have people that are 12th generation Jerusalemite, I mean, how many of those can there be? I know, and this tens, not even hundreds. one of the few examples you have of saying, hey, Jews have had a presence here for thousands of years. Thousands of years. Not all of us. No. But there's always remained this seed. That's, that's incredible. Been... I have a friend of mine who's sixth generation Israeli, and I was impressed about that. It is. 12th Jerusalemite. But it's very impressive. And there's a second piece that I want everyone to pick up here. Yeah. The concept of the hospitality and the giving. This is all part of the Gimil hospitality. The third fundamental, right. You see a stranger, you see someone you don't know. On the know, Sabbath. You give them hospitality. And as And we're you, talking about a poor community in the main. Exactly. So it's and not that they have so much to share, but uh, they do. And the people in this area look pretty much the same as the people down the hill. There's no difference between them. Black, white, long coats, side locks, yarmulkes, everything looks the same, right? But uh, just the feeling of the place itself, completely different. Michael, one of the things about this community that really has stood out since we've started running here is the amount of kindergartens and playgrounds for children. <laughs> they are just everywhere. As we mentioned, look at the average uh, family size. Right. 
So every single kids. time we cut through these new complexes, and again, these are very many of the new ones, everything has playgrounds in the middle. It's just set out that way. It must be one of the only communities that's sort of built around its children more than anything else, which what? is kind of funny. Look, you know, we talk about the Jewish values and the yeah, family. Sure. Yeah, it right. says many times in the Torah that you shall teach them to your children. By the way, if anyone's ever traveled around Europe, okay, sure. it's a totally different feeling. You don't see children a lot of places. I remember right. when I went to Greece with my wife and the only places we saw kids the entire time were when we were at airports, we didn't get on the plane back to Israel. Right. Oh, so some of these countries, the birth rate is so low. Yeah. And here we're talking, it's through the roof. So this is an organization called Atsala. And they do what? They're first responders, uh, an ambulance service. Uh, right. So, you know, if there's an emergency, they're there. First aid emergency we're talking about. Yes, right. but it's it's an organization that was started and run by Haredim, and it's totally volunteer. The people who work in it are also these, these first responders, also have other jobs. Right. Uh, but they do amazing things, and they're always the ones on the scene. Right, so it's basically a bunch of people who go to work, who go to their study houses, whatever it is they do, walk around with walkie-talkies, and these kind of mopeds that you see zipping around dump everything, jump on them open and go and save lives. And amb ambulance services around the world usually have like an average six minutes, seven minutes. Their average is, comes into under two minutes that they arrive at a call and they're completely volunteer. They are unbelievable. Um, and in Israel, US, UK, plenty of other places around the world, built by the community for the community uh, to save lives. Absolutely incredible. And if we can get into another little gory side of it uh they are some of the first responders to terrorist attacks that happen here yeah and one of the things you have in jewish law is that when you bury a body you want to have as many a whole as whole as possible correct but if you've just been you know blown up by a bomb there are body parts and pieces all over the place right, exactly. and they actually will go and try to collect as many of the body parts and pieces as they possibly can in order to be able to bury them. So that's actually Hatsada's sister's organization called Zaka. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're right. Um, who do do such work. You're right. Their sorry. work is also incredible. They also help to prepare the dead to give respect um, before burial. See, this is why he's the tour guide. <laughs> no, <laughs> just too many years with things blowing up. <laughs> okay, Michael. I've just gone past the entrance of the city. We know that from run number two. So that's already outside Jerusalem, what we can see in front of us on the next hill. Yeah, and this is such a hidden gem in the area. I love this place. And to be honest with y'all, uh, the first time I came down here, I knew about it. The first time I came down here was actually when we were preparing for this. With me, I knew this one. Daniel's hidden gems, come on. From his mountain biking days. <laughs> yes. Um, there is a mountain biking trail that kind of is in the valley, Balas, uh, which is amazing. Runs for kilometers and kilometers, and it ends up with this climb back up to Jerusalem, which really tests your uh, your mental <laughs> now, strength. Now, the thing. place we're going to is a place called Lifta, okay? It's, yeah. it's a former Arab village that was here and up until the 48 war. Now, what's fascinating is you can see the highway down below us. Yes. Okay, now you have to imagine, this is the main highway. So the left is the main highway towards Tel Aviv, guys. But you have to understand that in order to access Jerusalem up until 1948, you're talking about like a six meter wide road going up the mountains. Yeah. So the expansion that we've seen is really quite phenomenal. Right. So let's go back to this town. This town is called Lifta. What, what is this place? So, first of all, do you remember when we talked about the uh, Machane Yehuda, the market? Sure. We said that it was established because you'd have Arabs from one of the nearby villages that would come here in order to, or come there in order to sell their wares and, right. and vegetables and all kinds of For stuff. For sure. They're coming from Lifta. Uh -huh. So this is the town they came so from. So this was an Arab town? It was an Arab village, really. Village, village. Okay. Uh, that Agricultural kind of, village? Yeah, but right. it, it flourished really under the time of the Ottomans.
Okay, so this was an agricultural village until when? Because... Until the war in 1948. And then uh, what happened in 48? So if we go back to the 1948 war, it starts a civil war between the Arab and the Jewish populations that were here. Now, the Arab strategy was to cut off any isolated Jewish settlements, Jerusalem being one of them, because there's only one way in and out. Right. Lifta okay. is going to, as you see, occupy one of the hills above the road going in. Right, they so have the high ground for lack of basic terms. Exactly, and right. there are a bunch of these Arab, Arab villages all along the road to Jerusalem. Uh -huh. So what the Jews want to do is open up the road to Jerusalem, okay? What the Arabs want to do is block it. Lifta is going to become one of the casualties there because the Jews ultimately are successful and they uh, take this village and expel all the residents. So today it's basically, it's been abandoned from there till now. Yes. Yeah, so. There was talk, by the way, uh, of building up like a luxury residence here because look at, look at this scenery. It's amazing, it's unbelievable. Uh, yeah. But luckily that got nixed and they've, it's one of the few places where they've actually preserved. The old well, Arab village well, as it was. they haven't torn them down, they haven't really preserved them, they haven't torn them down. Right. So most of our first run, Michael, was in the ultra-Orthodox Haredi community. And now we're running down into this old, uh, what, was a, what was an abandoned village, yeah, what is an abandoned village, what was a, originally a village. And right at the bottom of the hill, well, not right at the bottom of the hill, but in these steps in a minute, we have a, a water source. Yep, you have a beautiful spring. Yeah. And it's actually used by the Haredi community and others as what's called a mikvah. What's a mikvah? A mikvah is a Jewish ritual bath. And by the way, if we go back to the Shabbat experience, okay? Yeah. Especially in the Hasidic and Haredi world. Yeah. Every Friday morning, men are gonna go and dip or immerse in the mikvah, okay? Which is basically you strip down to your birthday suit, you dunk in the water, and it's kind of like a rebirth. It's in like a, way. a it's like a spiritual cleansing of exactly. some description before exactly. before the holy day. Right, okay, exactly. fine. And so here we have a natural water source. It's the water which is coming off the hill, basically. Yes. Because we're in the valley, yeah, or we're starting at the beginning of the, of the valley. It's a spring, you know, and it comes here, into the mountain until it hits a, a here's, layer. Here's an excellent example of someone having their spiritual much. Yep, you got it. Um, so it actually runs into here and then it continues running the whole way down the hill um, until when it comes to a completely different reservoir, which is much, much bigger, which is the Betzite Reservoir, which is all the way down there. But we're going to follow the water for a second because the water kind of continues down. So this amazing stream, we're following the water like we did in Iron Care, Michael. Yeah. Exactly the same, water coming off the hill. Follow the stream. The stream actually goes all the way down the hill. You can keep running with it all the way into the valley and just keep going and some. So let's follow the water for a little bit and let's kind of see the outlook of the entrance to the city and what would have been the traditional entrance to the city. I'm assuming 47 people came up more this way than the way they do today. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. But this is, the, remember, this is one of the villages on the slopes it held surrounding the, yeah. the, the pass. Were there other villages on these high grounds at that there time? There were. There were all dotting the, <laughs> the, hills the road around us. from here going down to Latrune area. Right. There are Arab villages all up through here. And one kind of still exists, which is Abu Ghosh, which is 
oh, yeah, and fun. why does that still exist? Because Abu Ghosh was one of the few didn't places take that did, said we're not yeah. going to became, fight against the right. the Jews here, and they were allowed to stay. All right, so these are the original houses. What you can see above us, guys, are the original lifter houses of this old agricultural village that are still here. As Michael says, his face has never Jewish been developed. With Jewish spiritual graffiti. <laughs> with, uh, with, uh, yes, with, uh, I don't know about spiritual, but uh, yeah, with graffiti. <laughs> hey, it's about, it's about a uh, Hasidic Rebbe. It's, it's not, true, it is about a Hasidic It's not Rebbe. like saying, you know, let, let's all go destroy each other. That's it's true, like... that's true, that's true. Whoops, watch your pedals. Now, by the way, you see all the uh, cactus plants here. These are the Sabra plants. Right. Okay. Now, if you're ever wandering around, you see a whole bunch of these, it's, there's a good chance that there used to be an Arab village there because they used to plant them as kind of like uh, fences or shrub. Or oh, really? Like around. an agricultural defense? Yeah. That's cool. And, uh, and, and Israelis, local Israelis, native-born <laughs> Israelis are actually called Sabras. Sabras, yeah. Why? Because the fruit of the Sabra tree is very prickly on the outside, but if you open it up, it's very like soft on the inside. Soft and mushy on the inside. Famously. Okay, Michael, that was around a five and a half kilometer run. We're here right below the entrance of Jerusalem. At Lifta. At Lifta. I'm standing literally, it's a bit hard to see, but on the roof of one of these houses. These are the steps what Michael leading into the original house itself. And that is the beautiful greenery of Jerusalem Forest, which we may or may not be checking out in the next run. Michael, five and a half kilometers. This was a wonderful run. Great run. I hope you guys learned something new. I hope you got to see something new. Yeah. And uh, looking forward to joining us on future runs. Exactly. Check us out next time running around Jerusalem. Have a good one.